Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherilyn Parsons. I am the founder. I'm going to take this off. There we go. That's a little better. I'm the uh, founder and director of the Bay Area Book Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've had, have you had a great festival? Yeah? I have. It's been fantastic, and I get so sad at this point. It's like it's almost over for a whole year, but we are planning to come back next year, and it'll be the same time around late April, early May. We're still settling on the date, but uh, we hope you can join us again. And um, I am here to introduce our closing keynote um, with Pico Iyer. Hooray! Interviewed by John Freeman. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, but just to talk about the topic of um, this closing keynote, um, you know, this, this festival, we've spent a lot of time looking at, somebody waving at me? No. Uh, look, looking at um, uh, divisiveness and dialogue and sort of intellectual engagement with issues a little bit below the surface. And I heard Pico Iyer speak at the Jaipur Literature Festival in India back in late January of this year. And his talk was very much about overcoming divisions through the power of literature um, and, and, and connecting with people across cultures and across differences. And I spent much of that festival trying to persuade Pico to join us. And so he, he was able to do that, which we appreciate. Um, so I first met Pico. See if I can move around with this. I first met Pico uh, about 15 years ago at the LA Times Festival of Books, and I, like you, was a fan. And I screwed up my courage afterwards and went up and talked to him that I hope many of you will do at the uh, signing after the talk today. And um, we've just stayed in touch over the years. I've read, I think, most of his books. He's written 12 books, uh, Video Nights in Kathmandu. Some of you remember that book. One of his first really changed the genre of travel writing. Um, Lady and the Monk uh, in Japan. Uh, yes, yeah, it's actually my favorite of, of his. Fantastic book. Um, Graham Greene, he wrote the book on Graham Greene, The Man in My Head. Uh, most recently, his book is The Art of Stillness. And one of the things I really like about Pico is how he is such a consummate traveler on the outside in terms of countries he's visited, Iran, North Korea, all over the world, and yet he pays so much attention to the inner experience, not only of travel, but of being human, which of course is what travel is ultimately about, but he looks at the inner journey as much as the outer journey. Um, he has done several TED Talks. He's been viewed eight million times on TED, so we're indeed lucky to have him with us today. And of course, he has uh, written many, many hundreds of articles and um, has edited books as well. So we are delighted to have him. What's going to happen today is he's going to speak for uh, about 35 minutes, and then he will be joined on stage by John Freeman. Let me tell you a little bit about John. Uh, someone I've also admired from afar for so many years. He is a uh, leading literary critic today. He is currently the editor, he's a founder and editor of a journal called Freeman's, which is published twice a year. We had a session on Freeman's at the festival, looking at um, emerging writers and bringing in established writers and bringing them together in a journal of the best, some of the best of contemporary writing. He was editor of Granta, the International Literary Journal for many years, and uh, he is currently also, uh, I believe, editor-in-chief of Lit Hub, Literary Hub, uh, which is something I check every single day. It's a uh, site of uh, contemporary writers writing about literature, and it also aggregates. He is also a writer himself in terms of books. He's got five books. The first one is called The Tyranny of Email. Can we appreciate that? Um, he's written another one called um, How to Read a Novelist. So if you like festival settings like this, interested in interviews of writers, that's a fantastic book to get behind the scenes. Um, he's written two books about inequality in America, one called The Tale of Two Cities, set in New about New York City, and then another one, uh, Tale of Two Americas, I believe it's called. Most recently, his book is Maps, which is an exquisite poetry collection also looking at travel, both on an inner and outer journey level. Um, so, so after Pico speaks for about 35 minutes, John will come up, interview Pico, 
think they might interview each other back and forth a little bit, and then they'll take your questions. And then after that, there'll be a book signing. They'll both be out there, and I do encourage you to meet them. So let me now, let's all welcome Pico Iyer. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Sherilyn, for such a soulful and beautiful introduction. Uh, even my mother wouldn't be so generous. Uh, actually, especially my mother <laughs> wouldn't be so generous. But thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. There are so many beautiful things you could be doing on a sunny, late spring Sunday afternoon in Berkeley. I'm really touched you would come uh, and join us to talk about literature. Uh, you are probably horrified and appalled to see me in a jacket and tie. Um, I'm actually horrified and appalled to be wearing one. Uh, the only reason I am uh, is that not so long ago, I heard that people actually have to pay uh, to be here. And I thought <laughs> there is nothing I could possibly say that anybody would want to pay to hear. Um, my friends and family would actually pay handsomely for me to shut up and never <laughs> to say anything. So I thought the only way I could uh, rise to the price of admission was uh, put on my only good set of clothes and pretend to look respectable. Um, especially because, uh, sadly, I'm not a former cabinet secretary and I haven't written a book on the common good. Uh, but as you just heard from Sherilyn, uh, quite a few years ago, I was walking along the sunlit lawns of a really decaying palace in Jaipur, in northern India, and this very bright-eyed, elegant young woman came up to me and said that her dream was to start a Bay Area book festival in deference to the fact that really no community in this country so cherishes books as here. And of course, I was really intrigued. And a couple of years later, I was walking across the campus in Westwood, just as the sun was declining behind the buildings. And I met Sherilyn again, and she said her dream was almost a reality. And would I be part of the first ever Bay Area Book Festival? So I was, and lo and behold, here we are at the fourth. And I think one reason I was so delighted to be here was that I've always really admired, especially the East Bay's commitment to speaking truth to power, to thinking about things differently than convention suggests. Uh, I've always, of course, loved and benefited from the fact that you so respect books and ideas here. Uh, and I've always uh, loved the fact that you really take seriously your position and your responsibilities within the global community. Uh, and apart from all that, you have the only shop I've ever seen that sells nothing but dog collars. <laughs> Just, yeah, you know the shop, you, nine blocks down Shattuck. I couldn't believe it, nothing but dog collars. I'm still recovering from that. Uh, but I've really never thought it was a coincidence that two of America's greatest literary visionaries, the late Ursula Le Guin and Philip K. Dick, both went through Berkeley High, a couple of blocks from here. Um, yeah, uh, Berkeley High deserves many um, rounds of applause. And if ever you're driving along Euclid and you see this really rickety 23-year-old vomit green Toyota Tercel inching along the road uh, with a hairless guy at the wheel looking around for for sale signs, I'm sorry to say that's me. Um, I'm one of the many people who over the years has often thought how wonderful it would be to move to the Berkeley Hills. So I was really glad when this January, as you heard, uh, I was again in this even more <laughs> decaying palace in Jaipur. And I met Sherilyn and she asked me to be here this afternoon. But then she delivered a sentence guaranteed to strike terror in the heart of any speaker, and even more in the heart of any uh, audience member. <laughs> and she said, well, we'd love you to speak for an hour on, <laughs> you remember it, on how literature deepens and advances uh, the common good. And as soon as she said that, I remembered how every year or two, I go to New York to visit my publisher. And I'm always telling him excitedly about my latest book project. 
And whenever I see him, he has only one question. And his question is not, is it good? Not, is it original? Not, is it true? He just says, is it short? <laughs> um, he knows, famously, a few years ago, Microsoft, no less, told us that the average human being now has a shorter attention span than the average goldfish. No exaggeration. And the average goldfish ain't reading Proust, believe me. <laughs> and the average goldfish ain't having to listen to a closing keynote at the Bay Area Book Festival. So I really do believe that we are living in a golden age of literature. And I do believe we're entering a brave new world. If we were having this festival 30 years ago, I don't think we would have had uh, or had the chance to listen to somebody from Kenya and somebody from Vietnam and somebody from Morocco, as we have this weekend. Really, Rockridge, so many parts of Berkeley, the whole Bay Area speak for this exciting new world we're entering. And I really do believe that all of us need to catch up on our sleep, and I will do everything possible to assist you in that project. <laughs> Uh, so believe me, don't worry, as Sherilyn said, I'm not going to talk for an hour, maximum half that time, and then we will get to hear from somebody who really does know about these topics, unlike me, uh, as a writer and an editor and a critic, John. But I was thinking as I was driving up here yesterday, many millennia ago, in the Pleistocene era probably, when I was a student, uh, I spent eight years of my life studying nothing but literature. Not a single hour of history or chemistry or sciences or political science or languages, just literature, literature, and more literature, getting more unemployable with every passing season. <laughs> and in England in those days, studying English literature meant studying Chaucer and Beowulf and a uh, rather gnomic Anglo-Saxon poem called The Wanderer. Not a single text after 1832, and even American literature was so beyond the pale that it was relegated to a special paper. And I don't think anybody then could have guessed that within just five years, English literature was being made by writers whose names most English people couldn't pronounce. Rushdie and Ondachi, Ishiguro, Kurtzia, Okri, Ghosh. And suddenly our pages were crackling with parpadams and Bollywood jingles and Nigerian gods. Suddenly we were surrounded by different rhythms and strange spices and new spirits. And Salman Rushdie was reminding us that Britain could actually be liberated by India and the West Indies and its former colonies. And Arundhati Roy was walking through this tropical garden, almost like a new Eve, renaming all the flowers. And the writer from Hong Kong, Timothy Mo, in the 1980s, published a 280-page book set in contemporary London with not a single white character, even in the background. And what all these writers were doing, I think, was not just throwing open the windows and doors of the dusty, cobwebbed house of English literature, but really bringing into our midst new stories, new histories, new ways of telling history, new ways of telling stories, and bringing into England what it hadn't had so much before, bold passion and really unembarrassed emotion. And as you all know, what was happening in England in the 1980s spread quickly across Canada and finally caught up with Canada's younger brother, this country. Uh, and in the Bay Area, I hardly need to tell you that the story of modern Chile has really been unfolded in Marin by Isabel Allende. And the great stories of China over the last 70 years have played out right here through Maxine Hong Kingston and Amy Tan and Yu Yun Li. And the ancient legends of India have been given new life in Berkeley itself by the late Bharati Mukherjee and Vikram Chandra and so many other um, writers. And I think what all these writers are doing is taking the customs and tradition of their parents, knocking them against their own background growing up in the United States, 
finding new frictions there, but also really finding beautiful new possibilities. And I think when we talk about the common good, we're really talking about the common ground. And we're all aware that the ground is constantly shifting under our feet, but the beauty of the common ground now is it's rainbow colored and it's speaking in many languages all at once. I'm still quite often shocked when I remember that the single greatest travel writer in North America and the person who's written most passionately and honestly and searchingly about identity was also for eight years officially the most powerful person on the planet. And of course, Barack Obama couldn't see the world in terms of black or white because he was black and white. He was from Kenya and Indonesia and Hawaii and, and Kansas. And sometimes I think this made for problems. Uh, not everybody could see where he was coming from. And sometimes maybe even Mr. Obama couldn't see where he was coming from. But by and large, I think he was beautifully in sync with this new world in which the average person you meet on the streets of Toronto was born in a foreign country. And the national dish of Britain by popular assent is chicken tikka masala. <laughs> really, <laughs> no exaggeration. And probably the most popular writer of nonfiction in our language, Malcolm Gladwell, is half Jamaican, half English. And maybe the greatest essayist in our language, and certainly one of the most radical younger novelists, Sadie Smith, half Jamaican, half English. One foot in the new world, one foot in the old. And I think all these new writers are coming to the fore to speak for and to speak to a whole new generation of readers. And if the capital of English literature in the 19th century was London, and in the 20th was New York, I think so far there's no doubt that the capital of 21st century writing in English is Mumbai. Uh, I was in Washington DC just a couple of years ago and I met a writer friend and we went out for lunch. And within five minutes, we had come up with 14 classic, contemporary, enduring works all set uh, around Mumbai. And this is not just of passing interest, because, of course, for all of you in the East Bay, Mumbai is just down the street. And so is Hanoi, and so is Tehran, and so is Guatemala City, and so is Mogadishu. Uh, actually, when I go to Silicon Valley, I see so many people from Bangalore, I can't believe anyone's left in Bangalore anymore. <laughs> and, I mean, it's also really important because I think one reason that Sherilyn goes to Jaipur every year and the reason I go there so often is that when we're in this country, I think all we hear about is bookshops are closing, many beloved bookshops here in Berkeley, uh, magazines are dwindling, publishers are running around panicking on the decks of the Titanic. And every time we go back to India, there were more new publishing houses, more magazines, more readers really excited to talk about page 163 of the latest book by Juno Diaz or Haruki Murakami. There's a huge hunger and thirst for the written world in other parts of the world that sometimes we forget uh, over here. And I think this is also really essential because of course the stories of anywhere are the stories of everywhere. And just an hour and a half ago in this room, I got to hear Dave Eggers, the East Bay's own Dave Eggers. And some of you may know his most recent book that came out a couple of months ago is about a young man from Yemen, but it plays out in the Tenderloin and Treasure Island. And before that, he wrote a beautiful novel about a Syrian in New Orleans during Katrina. And before that, he wrote a rending book about a lost boy from South Sudan ending up in Atlanta. Uh, I have a, a wonderful writer friend across the bay in Pacific Heights, the uh, Mexican-American essayist Richard Rodriguez, and he always says, I'm Chinese because I'm living in a Chinese city. And it sounds flip at first, but walk down the street from where he lives and you're on Grant Street, all the signs are indeed in Chinese. And I think he's really thinking ahead of the curve by saying that. Um, the other is in our backyards now, the other is in our beds, and very often the other is in ourselves. 
And as Sholin was saying in the introduction, I think one reason it's so important to remember that is that we all know there are a lot of people who have been deeply unsettled by this rainbow flood and really want to turn the clock back to a much simpler time of us versus them. Uh, we've all witnessed in the last few years across the planet this great rise of brutal nationalism and tribalism, almost as if the countryside is rising up against the city and the desperate are rising up against what they see as the privileged. And the past is rising up to try to yank the future backwards. And in that context, I think literature is really indispensable because literature is the voice of the individual. And the individual is much more multiple and nuanced and alive than any ideology. She knows that she can't be pushed into a single box. She knows that her emotions can't be reduced to simplicities. And she also knows that the more she's all over the place with bits of herself in many different continents, the more everywhere is all over the place with bits of itself in many continents. Uh, every time a Pakistani woman uh, falls in love with a Swedish man, probably in Piedmont, <laughs> the, the little girl who arises out of that union is going to throw another black or white distinction out the window. And I really think one of the most inspiring statistics I've read in what is otherwise not a source of inspiration, the New York Times, uh, was the fact that, according to them, in 1958, 4% of Americans were in favor of mixed race marriages. By 2015, the figure was 87%, almost 22 times more. That's a thought from 4% to 87% in just two generations, hence Barack Obama, and Malcolm Gladwell, and Zadie Smith. And it was actually very near here in Corte Madera many years ago that a woman said to me, well, maybe I don't think so warmly about Islam. But lo and behold, my daughter marries somebody from Iran. And suddenly, my granddaughter is half Iranian and Islamic. How can you hate your granddaughter? Not everybody thinks that way, of course, but I think more and more of the world is moving in that direction. And you all know, especially here in Berkeley, that none of this is new. Uh, my first book that Sherilyn mentioned actually came out this week, 30 years ago. And even then, I took great pains to make sure that the last chapter to catch this reversal of history's tides was called The Empire Strikes Back. And then 25 years ago, with the help of colleagues at Time magazine, uh, I wrote a long essay on the literary aspects of this called The Empire Writes Back. But I really don't think that any of us guessed that the flow of bodies across borders would explode so dramatically and so quickly. The number of displaced people on the planet now is 45 times greater than when the UN High Commission for Refugees was set up in 1950. So that's really a thought. Right after the most terrible war that humanity had ever known, there were only 1 45th or 2% as many uprooted people as there are right now. And I think we all know the challenge and the tragedy of the refugee situation. But at the same time, I think for the privileged few, which is most of us in this room, this erosion of borders has made for really exhilarating possibilities. And I'm guessing most of you probably remember a classic novel, which was also turned into a classic movie that's also celebrating its 25th anniversary right this year, The English Patient. And if you saw it or read it, you'll remember that the main character is a map maker who almost dies because he's not English. And the young woman who tends to him has this wonderful name, Hana, which could be Czech or Japanese, or in fact what it is, Canadian. And she's also often known as Pico. 
Uh, there's another Canadian who enters the scene, and he has this quintessentially Italian name, David Caravaggio, but he's lost both his thumbs to an Italian soldier. And the fourth protagonist, as you probably recall, is risking his life every day to defuse bombs for the British army, but he's not British, he's Indian. In fact, he's a Sikh, nicknamed after a salty fish. And in the midst of World War II, when people are dying because of the religions they represent or the passports they carry, these four wounded characters assemble in this shattered convent, and they really sing into being a new world in which nobody knows where anybody comes from and nobody cares. A world of map makers and nurses and diffusers of bloms and, for good measure, thieves. A world of the desert where there are no boundaries visible in the sand. Where all communal histories, communal books, Michael Ondaatje writes there, and he could write that because he had siblings on four continents. And of course, his wife, the wonderful writer Linda Spaulding, was at this festival this weekend. She's from Kansas, so that's a fifth continent. Uh, this is all kind of abstract and, and academic, so maybe I'll, I'll pull back and take you briefly into the world uh, as I see it. A couple of years ago, uh, I woke up one day in my mother's house in Santa Barbara, and uh, I got into a plane, and I flew through a day and a night, and another day, and then part of another night. And then I got out of the plane at 2.25 in the morning in the city of Mashhad in northern Iran. And even though it was so late, my local guide was waiting for me when I came through customs. And very quickly, I found he spoke much, much better English than I do. Uh, he had been educated at a boarding school near London in the 1970s. And we walked out of the airport terminal. It was 3 o'clock in the morning by now. And the whole parking lot was just jam-packed. Everywhere we looked, there were people sitting on the ground, on carpets, drinking tea, sharing sweetmeats, uh, having a merry old time. And we got into our car to drive to the hotel. And as we were edging our way through these thronged streets, uh, my guide started pointing out every passerby who either looked like John Cleese or Mr. Bean. Um, <laughs> Very much not what I'd expected, flying to Iran. And we pulled up at this very luxurious five-star hotel, left over from before the revolution, and I went up to my room, and it was a small, bare space, but it had a copy of the Holy Quran and an arrow pointing to Mecca, and, best of all for me, a TV. <laughs> so I thought, finally, my chance to see Iranian TV. So... I turned it on, what should I see but Piers Morgan on CNN talking about gun control. And I was so taken aback by this, I thought, well, I've got to convey it to my friends back in California. So I went online to send some emails, and the internet connection in Mashhad was much faster than the one in the hills of Santa Barbara. And about two hours later, I went down to the lobby for breakfast, and I saw that there was a mosque there. But right next to the mosque was a Swarovski crystal shop. And all around were the most elegant, chic young women I've ever seen in Chanel and Dior under their hijabs, tapping away at smartphones. And I walked out into the street to see exactly where I'd landed up because it was hard to make out at three in the morning. And I found we were on a broad, spotless, very modern boulevard lined with high-rises. And I raced across the street to see what they were. Every one of those high-rises was a bank. And I really thought, this is almost like being in Dubai. And in the course of the day that followed, my guide showed me any number of beautiful surprises and grace notes. But when we returned to the hotel in the evening, I thought, well, finally, I can slip away from my guide and see uh, Iran uncensored. So I told him I wasn't going to have dinner, and I went down to the lobby to the taxi desk. 
and I presented my appeal, and the people there very graciously set me up with a driver who's probably about 30 years old, spoke pretty good English, was very, very friendly. And he led me out to his little car, and we took off into the dark. Unbeknownst to me, I had arrived in Mashhad during the most festive week of the year there, the birthday of the saint who is buried in its central shrine. So all the main boulevards were strung with lights, and seven million pilgrims had come from every corner of the Shia world to mark this occasion. Hence, I realized belatedly that jam-packed airport parking lot. And of course, when we got to the central shrine, which is just seven huge marble courtyards, it was almost impossible to move. Every last inch was taken up. Again, people sitting on the ground, on carpets, drinking tea. They were releasing doves into the blue-black sky. Some of them were stretched out because they were spending seven days and seven nights in this place. Um, and they were surrounded by huge screens on which black-clad ayatollahs were delivering sermons. It was really quite a scene. And because my driver could tell that I was fairly sympathetic to his culture, I'd come all this way to learn about Iran, he offered to take me right into the Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctum where the saint is buried. So we walked into this tiny place, probably half the size of this stage, or maybe the same size as this stage, very, very, very crowded. And a few minutes later, I looked over, and I saw that his hand was on his heart, my driver's, and he was walking backwards so that he never presented his back to the long dead saint. And his eyes were welling with tears. It was really a very moving picture of Islamic piety. But when we were back out on the street and walking to his car, he started telling me about his wife who was pregnant with uh, their first child and was, he said, a blonde English woman living in Yorkshire. And then he told me how he had paid a human trafficker $2,500 to smuggle him into England in the back of a truck, breathing through a tube so he wouldn't be detected. And then he told me how the British government very magnanimously had given him a court-appointed lawyer and translator who had worked for three years to win him asylum status. In other words, he had risked his life to flee Iran, and now he was risking his life every summer to come back to visit the mother, the mosque, and the hometown that he missed so much. And when he dropped me back at my hotel that evening, I thought to myself, Iran has really been on our front pages every day the previous year, but I couldn't remember ever hearing about a dissident who nonetheless wanted to steal back into the country he had fled. And I'd almost never heard or read about a very devout, faithful Islamic soul who nonetheless didn't want to live in an Islamic republic. And, of course, this was embarrassing to me because, as Sherilyn was saying, I travel a fair amount. I, I feel I'm keeping up with the world. Uh, it was doubly embarrassing to me because I was actually the guy who was writing articles on Iran for Time magazine, drawing on the reports of my colleagues in the field. And it was quadruply uh, embarrassing to me because I once spent four whole years of my life reading up on and researching everything I could get about Iran to publish a 380-page novel partly set there, though I had never been. And yet, within three hours of getting there, I saw I didn't know a thing. And within 18 hours of being there, I had learned more than from my four years of research. And I sometimes think, and all of you know this, that in the age of information, we actually know less about our global neighbors than ever before. 
And I think we all sometimes keenly feel that in the age of globalism, it's easier than ever before to be provincial. And that sometimes the countries we hear about the most, we know about least. Uh, Iran, North Korea, Yemen, Syria, Cuba, because we know a lot about their leaders and maybe their nuclear policies, but we know painfully little about just regular folks and day-to-day -day life. Uh, so why am I going off in this digression? Well, partly I think that's the reason that I choose to travel, to make good on an opportunity that my grandparents couldn't have dreamed of. Really, we all know the world is open to the fortunate few as it never has been before in human history. And also, I think, to make good on an opportunity that 99% of our neighbors will never get to enjoy. Uh, when I'm in Haiti or Cambodia, Ethiopia, all the people I meet, I would say, just about all of them, would give anything to see the Bay Area or Las Vegas or Paris, but they will never have either the freedom or the means. And so I've always felt it's really up to us, the handful of people who are fortunate enough to be able to travel, to go and visit them, to start the dialogue. Uh, in any neighborhood, including the global neighborhood, the really scary person <laughs> is the one who bolts the door and draws the curtains and cowers or smolders uh, behind the sofa. But I also digress into Iran because I think that is one of the great reasons we read and we write. Because writing, serious writing, can take us into contradiction and ambiguity and the kinds of complexities that it's very hard for a video camera or a tape recorder to catch. It, writing gives us the larger picture. And by writing, I mean serious novels and serious nonfiction. Uh, as you heard, I've been working in the mainstream media for 36 years now. And sadly, the one thing I've learned from it is never to trust what I get from the mainstream media. Not in my experience because of any sinister conspiracy or intent to deceive, but just because the articles we read or the TV reports we see are produced by people like me who don't have a clue and who seldom have the time and space to do justice to all that we do know. And I think writing is what takes us into silence and takes us into doubt and takes us into those places that we really can't even put a finger on. And Sherilyn was saying in our introduction how I think many of us are concerned about the direction the world is going. And my sense has always been that a government, like a corporation, defines itself by distinctions. It needs an us versus a them. But cultures and individuals tend to be much subtler and tend to reach across the distinctions that governments insist upon. Uh, for example, our government has been at war with radical Islam for 20 years now. And as I'm sure many of you know, during those same 20 years, the single best-selling poet in the United States has, of all things, been an Islamic mystic, Rumi, from the 13th century. And I think some of Rumi gets lost in translation when he comes to us. But nonetheless, something in that antique verse is speaking to us as Walt Whitman or Emily Dickinson or Shakespeare are not. And conversely, if you get off the plane in Mashhad tomorrow, you will find that the Iranians are conversant with every detail of Game of Thrones or Westworld. Uh, when I was there, the book that was filling all the shop windows was Walter Isaacson's brilliant biography of Steve Jobs and Silicon Valley. And I think the great thing that writing can do is put us in the shoes and in the skin of somebody radically different from ourselves. And nowadays you will often hear people talk about cultural appropriation. And when they do, and when they describe it, it sounds very much like what I've always understood to be literature. <laughs> uh, to me, the whole point of writing is to enter the skin and being of somebody completely different from yourself. And by doing so, find out how much of the other is in yourself. 
when our country fell into this war with radical Islam, I really felt as an American citizen of Hindu origin, so sadly my forebears have often been at odds with Islam, my civic duty was first to try to travel to the Islamic world, but if I couldn't do that, to call upon my greatest tool, which is the imagination, to dream my way over the garden fence and across the street into the eyes of my Islamic neighbor. That's why I spent all those years trying to write a book about how the world might look to somebody from Islam. And I think if cultural appropriation tells us that a writer shouldn't even try to see the world through eyes different from her own, that can be a very dark kind of nationalism. Um, I really don't want Toni Morrison to be told that she can't write in the eyes of a white person. And I, I really don't want to be told that just because I happen to be born in England to parents from India, that I can't try to understand any of you whose circumstances are probably quite different. Uh, I don't want Michael Ondaatje to be told he shouldn't try to imagine what it is to be a woman or a Hungarian count or a Sikh. And I think when we talk about the common ground, Henry David Thoreau reminds us beautifully that that's really the common wealth. And he says, with that liberating eye that he has, that really our common wealth is the wealth that we have in common. So he meant Boston Commons, Cambridge Commons, but it would apply to Tilden Park. He was talking about the rivers, the air, the water we have all in common, but I think it also applies to the words and the ideas and um, the passions that we have in common. And I probably don't need to tell anybody in this room, especially since this is Berkeley, <laughs> that um, our world is in a very wounded state at the moment. I think even sometimes in the literary sphere. Uh, England no longer rules the waves, but English too often does. And we don't really hear enough from people writing in other languages. Uh, poets probably are more and more eclipsed by novelists, and novelists more and more eclipsed by weapons of mass distraction. And in the world of the uprooted, which I've been describing, the land of deracination, really the divisions are as great as they ever have been between people like us in this room who can choose to leave home and see the world and the great undefended many who never wanted to leave their home and ache to go back to their home but were propelled out by warfare or poverty or natural disaster and probably will never manage to make their way home again. Uh, as you all know, even before this millennium began, three American individuals had the same net worth as 48 whole nations in the world. And one American individual had the same net worth as 100 million of his compatriots. And of course, in the last 18 years, those inequities have only intensified. And I think John can probably shed a lot of light on that. And so at a time when I think many people are worried about travel bans and walls, it's ever more essential to think about literature precisely because the imagination is no respecter of boundaries and fences. It knows that everything important gets communicated over the wall and under the wall and around the wall. And when I read the uh, beautiful fiction of Elizabeth Strout, I understand a little better why so many of my neighbors voted for Mr. Trump. Uh, when I devour the dazzling book by Stanford's own Adam Johnson, the orphan master's son, I'm moved to imagine what it might be like to be a North Korean. When uh, I read the stunning fiction of the East Bay's Antony Mara, I'm taken into Chechnya and all these other places I would be too shy or too scared to visit in person. The more the world is insisting on hard and fast divisions, the more literature takes us to the soft and the slow. And I think literature ultimately reminds us that what unites us is much more important than what divides us. And that's how my story becomes yours. Literature reminds us that instead of conducting wars, it makes more sense 
to hold festivals such as this because San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, nearly all the cities of the world now are tapestries made up of a myriad different cultures and traditions and faiths and more with every passing season. Literature recalls to us that really our drones are never going to deter terrorists. Our guns are never going to defeat nationalists. But our words, our ideas, our rigorous imaginations can at least take us a little bit past simplicities and recall to us that ultimately we change the world only by changing how we look at the world and how we dream of it. Uh, so I'll just end this interminable spiel by um, offering very heartfelt thanks to Sherilyn and all her colleagues for working so hard to make this festival happen year after year and um, to thank all of you for daring to believe that the most important state of all is actually the state over which we have the most power, the imagination. Thank you so much and John Freeman. Now if I could just listen to that every day for two and a half more years, I think everything will be okay. <laughs> Not uh, everybody reads, so all listens. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's hugely encouraging to hear you, hear you speak. Um, and uh, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. And so I, I'm going to steer us around a little bit about, back towards beginnings since you began in your own pl Pleistocene era. <laughs> um, let's go back a little bit further, and I'm just curious, um, you know, you, you've described in Evelyn Waugh that the, the, the great capacity of a travel writer is, is to be surprised. Mm -hmm. And I think to be a reader, you have to be opening, you have to be open to being surprised. And I'm, I'm curious, and to joy, mm -hmm. you have to have a capacity for joy. Um, and I, I wonder where that came from in, in you. Where, who gave you that? I think travel did. I mean, travel is a leap of faith. As you say, maybe somebody who's not joyful doesn't want to leave home. And that itself can be a very serious, vicious cycle, we all know. But I think to go anywhere that's different from home, you're implicitly trusting the universe. And you're assuming, you're saying to the universe, I'm going to see something that's going to take me back. Uh, we all know that we move essentially to be moved. And to be moved is to be startled to see something we didn't imagine that the world could provide. So I'm not sure that the joy is so important, that that's a byproduct, but I agree with you, it's wonderfully said, that the capacity to be surprised and, and the openness to surprise is, um, is a great thing. And I often think the one thing you don't want to take when um, you're on a trip is your expectations, because they defeat um, themselves. Uh, and the things that we find most wonderfully are the things we never thought to look for. And for example, the first time I took my Japanese wife to Paris, I knew she was really determined to see the Louvre, the Champs-Élysées, the Eiffel Tower, and well, she should be, but I also knew that the main memory she would take home was of some backstreet cafe that she could imagine she discovered. And I think, I mean, to answer your question a little more personally, I was blessed, as you heard, to grow up to Indian parents in England and then to move to California when I was seven. So even as a seven-year-old boy, I thought, hey, I've got an English accent, an Indian skin, American green card. And the blessing of this is that I have parts of myself in lots of different places, but I'm not beholden to or imprisoned within any. And I can bring these perspectives into different combinations. I can look at California through British eyes. I can see Britain through Californian eyes. I can Thought, think about the passages and the conspiracies between cultures, as some of the writers I was describing do. But at that time, in the 1960s, I thought this is really unusual blessing I've been given, to be a traveler from, from birth and to always be partially home and never entirely home. And I never guessed that within 40 years, this would be the normal condition. And probably if we were walking down Shattuck right now, 
the majority of people we see would have more cultures inside themselves than I. So I'm, I have a kind of simplistic, <laughs> non-multinational background by today's standards. And I, you know, for all the problems that brings, as you can tell, I think it's a great liberation. Mm. Um, I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. with Viet Tan Nguyen, who's been here, and we were discussing the concept of cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. which, when it was introduced in France, was a kind of pejorative and often used in anti-Semitic ways. But the organizers of this conference were saying, well, what if cosmopolitanism could be expanded? So it wasn't just people who could travel, who could get on a jet. Mm -hmm. It was people who moved by lack of choice, yeah. were in yeah. the same category, yeah. to some degree, as people who didn't. Um, who, 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 who just went as tourists. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on this in, in, a, in a time when the term of citizen and, and who gets to be a citizen is being uh, chiseled away at. I mean, of course we should resist that, mm. but is it time to look for a different kind of concept for individual that is globalized? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And you're right, I think global citizenship is much harder to acquire than American or English or Indian even, all of those you can get just by going to the embassy if you're fortunate enough. Whereas global citizenship is something you have to forge for yourself and as you say, you have to think about where am I accountable, where am I going to vote, which is my community and who do I answer to. Um, and you're right, the old phrase rootless cosmopolitans used to be where used dismissively. And I think the more you're a cosmopolitan, the more you have to be rooted and you have to think that if I don't have a physical space I belong to, which is the value or the, the affection or the passion that anchors me. And you really have to create a strong home inside yourself. In my case, as with many people, I was reminded of that when my physical home burnt down, I lost everything I own in the world. And the next day, if somebody said, where is your home? It had to be in my, my friendships, my values, my favorite song, the book that I always carry around inside my head. But again, as your question suggests, we are very privileged. And I don't think we can afford to talk in these um, sweeping terms for the people, as you say, who had no choice. They're facing the same questions, but they don't have 20 answers they can choose between. They don't even have one answer. Mm. Um, it's up to us to make the answers for them. And, you know, I've written a lot about Canada because Canada is the rare country that 40 years ago, thanks to the present prime minister's father, understood we're entering a global world and decided to welcome the world, uh, and, uh, and to make a whole new kind of society. Uh, and I shouldn't really say this in the United States, but if ever I'm traveling somewhere interesting and I meet someone with an American accent, I say, are you from Toronto or Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the connect Canada's engagement with the world, and in a literary way too, is much more involved and sophisticated than, than ours, and most people there are bilingual. And, you know, I live, I choose to live in Japan, and of course that's one of the least international societies. I was just thinking how two years ago Japan only accepted 27 refugees and Canada accepted 10,000 in one go. But let me ask you, I mean, you, you were the editor of the most celebrated international magazine. You follow international writing. Where do you see all this going? Well, I do think um, one of the things we're experiencing right now is that novels exist in, to show society to itself to some degree. That doesn't mean that there aren't novelists who write in refracted ways for the beauty of language and the strangeness of their own experience, but the novel as a genre is a social device. And so many of the places where interesting novels are coming from are places that are getting projections sent to them of themselves, places that have been colonized before, places that have been carved up into countries by uh, usually places like America or England or, or Belgium. And as those states uh, break down due to molestation from the outside and things from the inside, people have to rewrite the story of the nation. And so right now, some of the most exciting writers are coming out of um, African countries. They're, they're, yeah. they're coming, coming out of uh, Eastern Europe. I think one of the most incredible novels of our time is Svetlana Alexeyevich's uh, several volume non-fiction novel about the breakdown of communism and its effect on the ex-Soviet people, which mm -hmm. she sees as a novel in the sense that she collects stories mm -hmm. of people in their living rooms. She's doing what you just said in the sense that the most perfect novel would have the voice of every person in the society in which yeah. uh, is going to read that yeah. book. Yeah. Of course, that's, that's yeah. Karl Knausgaard, but that's a, that's a, a book of just one person, so mm. it's impossible. But with, with what she's doing is collecting voices from yeah. 
intimate spaces and collaging them into stories that feel like history but have the intimacy of lived experience. It's a collective memoir, really. Well, Juliet Suka, Ju there's a writer that, came, that, that grew up here in Berkeley named Juliet Suka who wrote two incredible novels, uh, The Buddha in the Attic and When the Emperor Was Divine, one about the Japanese internment and the other about Japanese male order brides coming to this state to build railroads and things. And the second book is told in a collective first-person voice of we. Mm -hmm. It's stippled through mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, details of those journeys, but it, because it's so beautifully written, it feels both collective and personal and intimate at the same time. Mm. And then you were mentioning the man whose name I always can't pronounce, Viet Nguyen, from Vietnam. Yes. And I know when Ken Burns' Vietnam documentary was showing a few months ago, for many people in this country, the really eye-opening, ear-opening thing was to hear um, the testimony of people, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, reminiscing about the war. And um, there, the author of The Sympathizer is re literally rewriting our history by telling the story of the Vietnam War in English from the Vietnamese perspective and a very combative perspective. And I mean, it's wonderful. So, so our history is now a collection of dialogues rather than a straight road. Well, I think you were onto this very early. The, the book in which that essay is collected is, is Tropical Cl Classical. And I highly recommend the essay because in addition to kind of narrating that point uh, of, of the fact that all former colonized countries were building writers who were gonna tell their story back, not just to the empire, but they were gonna look back at the empire. Yeah. And yeah. so it's not the empire strikes back, it's a reversal of the gaze. <laughs> and if you look yeah. at some of the most interesting uh, novels and stories um, from the last uh, 25 years, a lot of it has been in this mode, whether it's Jhumpa Lahiri or Viet Tan Nguyen or you know, Amanata Forna, who has a great new novel called Happiness, set in London. There are no white characters. All of them are, are sort of migrants of a sort. And they're looking at the English with this sort, sort of you know, turned head of, of a former Kipling character, mm -hmm. as if mm -hmm. they're looking at the, lo the locals. And I want to ask you a question because a couple uh, months ago I was in dialogue with Arundhati Roy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about the fact that our curricula for a long time was creating some of the boundaries or reinforcing them, the very ones I think you were celebrating literature can mm -hmm. transcend, mm -hmm. is creating projections that were actually harmful um, uh, occluding our view of, of many places. And Rebecca Solnit, who's been at this festival um, on her jetpack doing wonderful things, um, talks often about how a woman has to re-educate herself uh, because of the things that she learns in her formal education and the culture around her. How much of our attention should be spent, do you think, um, looking back at and um, asking questions of the old texts which might do that? I ask you that because there's an essay on Henry Miller in here. Mm. Um, you talk about evil and war. I'm sure you've read a lot of Kipling. And to bring it back to Roy, sh she recited several Kipling poems. And she said, this, to me, th this was damaging, but it wasn't lethal because mm -hmm. this taught me a, a, a joy of the language, and that I will take. That's beautiful, and I think Kipling favorably influenced many writers like that, and Michael Ondaatje has many tributes to Kipling in The English Patient, and I think even Rushdie might acknowledge him. So I think rather than looking back, we should look forward. And I think the main change in my lifetime is that when I was a kid, if somebody met somebody else, they would say, where do you come from? Now that question doesn't have so much meaning. I think it's much better to say, where are you going? You define yourself by your destination, your dreams, your priorities, more than the accident of geography or history that made you up. And so in the same way, I'm less interested in revising or revisiting Kipling or Forster or Shakespeare than all the exciting new things that are coming up from Arundhati Roy. Mm. And, um, so when I was talking about cultural appropriation, I wouldn't want Shakespeare to be told you can't write about Othello. You can't write about Desdemona, and you also can't write about Iago, because you're not the devil. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, you know, Shakespeare has lasted for 500 years, because he speaks to everybody in every culture, regardless of their tradition. And it has not to do with the color of his skin, but the content of his character. And so, in the same way, I don't think Kipling needs our attention at this point. But 
the beauty of the present moment is there are a hundred new Kiplings of which Arundhati Roy is, is one. And sometimes um, taking those old models and making them new. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend called Carol Phillips who is from St. Kitts in the West Indies but grew up in England. And his project has been taking all England's relations with the Caribbean and telling them from the other side of the telescope. Yes. Uh, he, has this he has a new novel about... Um, God, the woman who wrote... Jean Rees. Jean I was Reese. reading it this morning yeah. in, my, in the Shattuck Plaza. Exactly. And he had a wonderful novel called Cambridge. And <laughs> as soon as you see that title, you know, another dreary thing about a 15th century university. No, it's about a slave in the West Indies who's given the name Cambridge. And it's got a charge that no book about a musty English university would have. So um, that's the exciting thing that is, is happening. And what often strikes me, let's say, about the English writers on India... Kipling, Forster, Paul Scott, they often had great affection for India. And, and we shouldn't ideologize that affection out of existence. Mm. They had Indian friends. And I just revisited a passage to India recently. I'd read it maybe three times before, and I'd never really got so much out of it. And this time I saw it was a brave book. It, it, it acknowledged how much exists beyond the author's purview. And it was really more on the side of the Indians than... Um, than the English. Are you reaching that point where you're rereading as much as you're reading new material? Exactly. It's like visiting old friends rather than trying to make new ones. Uh, and, and revisiting old places, exactly the same, because you don't have to waste that time introducing yourself, and you begin at a level of depth and intimacy. Uh, and of course, the, the good books keep changing. Um, I read The Quiet American every year, and it's always different, and it's always telling me exactly what's in the New York Times. But even more so, and with more nuance. Uh, I read The Snow Leopard every year. Oh, it's a beautiful book. Yeah. I'm going to read a quote from your interview with Peter Matheson. Um, the Whoa, end, that the, was a good the end segue. Of it, oh. The end of it is, is uh, it, it, I wondered how much of this was to him and to you. Because the, the piece, it's an interview that you did in 1992. He was 65. He was publishing three books that year, teaching, traveling. He was about to come back from leading a, a trip through Bhutan. Um, he, he had that in that week filed a 132-page story for a magazine and also been in Colorado at a festival. It was a prodigious kind of life he was living. And at the end of it, um, he, he says to you, there's a line in Turgenev that absolute, absolutely haunts me. It's a suicide note, and the entire note is, I could not simplify myself. What an arrow through the heart. And, you know, he's, he's been talking to you. He's, he was practicing Zen, and, and yet he couldn't give up on the multitudinousness of his life. And I, I'm curious to, you know, I, I wonder how much of your peeling back on the travel, which is apparent to some degree in your work, how much of that coincided with the book that you were writing on the Dalai Lama? Um, mm. You know, because I, I feel in your work recently, especially the beautiful book on Graham Greene and this, this short kind of... Um, psalm to stillness, the art of stillness, a, a feeling that, you know, it's not volume, it's not information, it's not touching everything that we need to do, it's, it's touching the right things. Thank you. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful compliment and question. I think maybe it has to do with the longer I live in Japan, the more um, I absorb the Japanese aesthetic, which of course couldn't be more different than the Indian aesthetic, which is my native one. So, if, if an Indian person were writing a book about our conversation, it would be 400 pages long and crackling <laughs> with fireworks and linguistic play. And if a Japanese were doing so, it would probably be a haiku. And, uh, you know, the Japanese aesthetic is the power is everything that's left out mm -hmm. and that's pulsing between the sentences. And so uh, the more I get the chance to sit still in Japan, the more those silences seep into my being and, and maybe my sentences too. But thank you, thank you for noticing that, because I think certainly that wish to simplify oneself is common to me and many people. And uh, it's not in that book, but the poignancy of uh, Peter Matheson's life, as many of you know, he published, his last book came out three days after his death. Uh, and he had been a, a Soto Zen priest for 25 years then. And the book is called In Paradise, and it's set in Auschwitz, and it's nearly all a record of rage and impatience and lust and confusion. He was honest enough to say, I haven't found peace of mind. I'm not sitting on top of a mountain viewing everything with serene equanimity. It's a constant struggle. So I always admire that honesty in him. I wanted to ask you a question, though, because we were backstage, and 
you mentioned social media, and I'm not the person to talk about it because I don't know what it is. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I've often thought that one of the, the beauty of the real writing that you and I admire is it's a way of getting back at tweet consciousness. And that tweets, you, if somebody's shouting very loudly, you probably can't outshout him. You have to come at it from a different angle. And if somebody's tweeting a lot, you're not going to outtweet that person. <laughs> but you can write a beautiful 200 page novel that will change the field. Mm. So, how, you, as, for you as an editor, critic, and writer all these years, how has social media changed what you do and what you read? It, it's, a, it's a big threat to it in many ways. I mean, you have this, is this quote, I think it's in your, um, in your book on stillness where you say that solitude is only as good as the compassion it releases. And I, th I think we need solitude to, re to release compassion. And one of the best ways to be alone, to, have to experience solitude, is to, is to have the solitude of two with a book. You know, and a, and a book is a, is a compassion extraction device in, in many ways. And if you're interrupting your attention span every you know, 30, 13 minutes to check on the tweet war between two people, um, you're kind of, uh, you're obliterating uh, any ability to develop that kind of compassion. And uh, similarly, I think it, it makes it very difficult to, to write. Um, in a world where we're all performing ourselves, these avatars, um, you know, the, the, the audience really for a writer is, is themselves. Because they have to talk to themselves, you know, they create a, a version of themselves so they can talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, just as you write in the book about Graham Greene that you create a father figure in order to somehow figure out your own. Mm -hmm. I think authors are, are often doubling themselves so they, you know, they can figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. And for, for some people that double consciousness comes with their skin color. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. but for other people it's simply a, a fact of existential living. So. The social media, um, it, it's, it's a barrier, I think, to the, the, the experience of flow that it, it, it takes to write, but it's also, it's a, it, it gives you a false sense of what it feels like to be human. Um, mm -hmm. Dave Eggers came through New York last week and I met him briefly for a cup of soup, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> and uh, I, I was feeling really down because uh, I said this in another event, um, a friend of mine wrote an article that was just devastating about the impacts of, of sexual assault and the, the response on social media was largely great, but a few people's instant response was, I'm so sorry that at, eight, at age eight you were sexually assaulted, or that's terrible, that's pedophilia, but was, what about the women you dated, you know, after, and what did you do to them? And I thought, can we just give a guy a, a second, you know, to say, I'm being very vulnerable here right now mm -hmm. to experience this? And I think if that was happening in a public space like this, as all you're listening, you're quiet, if you were to say something that dramatic, I think mm. there would be a gasp and a mm. sudden swelling of the room of sensitivities. And on social media, there's a, there's a just inherent kind of desire for, for but what about that? Mm. And I, when we, see, we see the awfulness of this now because we went from the memoirist in chief to the tweeter in chief. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the values of those two juxtapositions are mm -hmm. stark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, want, I want to ask you a question, um, because you know, in Video Night in Kathmandu, you, you found this really beautiful way to look at the spread of American empire, which is to say that it, it's not completely received um, uh, totally. It, it's taken mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. twisted and mm -hmm. turned into mm -hmm. new things, mm -hmm. and it creates a kind of hybrid form, which is then somehow even better than the culture that America is putting out, which I, I agree with you on. And I also agree with you on the fact that it, it's, it's enriching literature, the fact that that loop is, is coming back. But you know, when, in Video Night in Kathmandu, what you were describing was the revolutionary impact of the VCR mm -hmm. and that technology, and now we have digital technology. Um, in all the travels that you've had to Yemen and Cambodia and Cuba and the RLC and you know, all, Bolivia, um, you, do, you, do, you, do you find that what you see is that literature travels as fast as the forms of culture we move, we think move fast? No, again, really good question. Literature doesn't travel as fast as, as Starbucks or um, the latest tweet or whatever. Uh, but it travels more than we imagine. As I was saying, 
Everywhere I go from Delhi to Istanbul, they're reading Haruki Murakami, who somehow speaks for this deracinated global suburbia where the pastor's uh, in the microwave and Miles Davis is on the system, but you're feeling lost. Mm. Where am I? Where is that person I care for? So I think a lot of people are relating to that sense of cultural displacement that a lot of the writers you mention um, enshrine. And as I say, in many parts of the world, uh, there's less distraction. And so they're devouring books where you and I may devour uh, magazine articles. I, I mean, I loved what you were saying a minute ago because I was thinking the two great luxuries in life are attention and intimacy. And anything that erodes that, we're impoverishing ourselves. And because I live in rural Japan, this is not quite an answer to your question, but every day I make a cup of tea, I go out onto the terrace, and I spend one hour with a, a novel or a fairly serious work of reportage. At the end of that hour, when I come back into the room, I can tell I'm a deeper person and more intimate and subtler and more alive. Uh, and, and reading is actually what stretches us and opens us out. I, and there aren't many things that do that. I've had a completely um, similar experience in that ever since the election and before the election, because let's face it, all the things that the election bother us about were with us before the tweeter, the tweeter in chief. Um, I, I, I've followed the news in a, in, a, in a monstrous way, as if somehow the consumption of the information would be, would give me agency yeah. to change it. Yeah. When the agency was in going out into public space and protesting and finding other like-minded people. But um, at a certain point I thought, I'm, I'm, becoming, um, I'm, be I'm becoming toxic. I'm yeah. poisoning myself yeah. um, with, with this. So I, I started my days completely differently. I got up and I read poetry for an hour. Uh, and then I would write for an hour. Yeah. And I had the exact same experience where I, I, it didn't matter, I, I just read random anthologies that have been sitting and neglected around the house. You know, some poems I like, some poems I don't, you know, but it, it just, it's, it's a completely different experience. And then by 10 o'clock, I'm the happiest person on earth. Yeah, and then it can all go downhill after there. Yeah. But. yeah. No, and I was going to say the agency is in writing. Rather than reading what a thousand other people are saying about Kim Jong-un or whatever the news of the day is, you have the possibility, you in particular, as a reader and writer, of actually having your own say, and that's probably much more fruitful. I, I, you know, I interviewed Philip Roth when the, the, the plot against America came out, mm. and I was in a similar kind of froth about um, Bush and, and his, his vulgarities against the human soul. <laughs> and, um, he, you know, Roth was a little bit more calm than I was, um, mm. but he, he, I, I was, you know, talking about maybe I should leave the country, and he said, why would you do that? You're one of the people who can change something yeah. by, by, you know, you're young, you're able-bodied, you, you could go out and protest, or you can actually write something. Yeah. And I, I felt, um, I didn't feel, I felt instantly better. I didn't feel chastened. I thought, that's right. And I think um, apathy right now is, is one of the, the severe problems of our current moment, because um, social media is a, is, a, is a giant projector of apathy because you, the, it, the reality is so torrential through it that you feel, if you, if you participate too much in it, you, you think, if I just sit here, basically everything will wash away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that bad. But if you uh, use your attention and hone it like a muscle, which is, you know, something I think this, that little book of yours is beautiful on, you know, it, and you, you have more power. And I want to ask you, you know, in that book you talk about... Um, developing the idea of nowhere. Mm. And I, want, I want under, wonder if you can describe that a little bit in the context of your remarks today. Um, because, you know, is nowhere the reading chair? Is nowhere, you know, um, the space between, you know, taking a shower and getting dressed for work? Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to define it, but how do you think it would be useful to describe it to the I, 300 I, friends yeah. we have here? Yeah, I like, I like those two definitions you just came up with. Uh, so. Nowhere is the place where you're not doing anything specific, not going anywhere. You know, as a writer, that the destination is always much less important than what you do with it. In other words, Philip Roth writing about Newark, New Jersey, is much more interesting than me writing about North Korea. North Korea is an inherently interesting thing, but what makes a piece interesting is what you bring to it. And Philip Roth, as a great writer, will take Newark, New Jersey, not an obviously interesting subject for most of us, 
and make it captivating. But nowhere in that book was um, just about the need to open a space in our head and a, a space in our schedule uh, to clear our heads. And to, I suppose it's about getting the larger picture. As you say, we're so close to the world now, we can't see the world and we can't see how best to respond to it. And nowhere is the place where you step back and take a larger perspective. I was just two weeks ago doing an event like this with Maria Popova, who's an interesting counterexample to this. Most of you know she's in her early 30s. She writes a very serious blog about the great writers and thinkers in history. She has seven million followers. In other words, she's won the world over on her terms mm. by not sending out fluff into the world, but really earnest, wholehearted thought and recommendations about great stuff. And so she was talking about the difference between, maybe I said this, reaction and reflection. Mm. And she said, we're reacting too much and reflecting not enough. And when I hear you talk about Philip Roth, the other thing that comes to mind is, of course, he spent a lot of time with Eastern European writers during the Cold War. And there was almost an envy that in their world, the writing had stakes because they were up against a very oppressive system. And writers were in imperiled, censored, had to work in the shadows and the margins. He saw a playwright become president, Vaclav Havel, and, uh, exact, and I think all that would have gone into the advice he gave to you, which is seeing how writers in very difficult situations uh, don't just move to Canada, but uh, <laughs> realize that this is their moment, actually, um, to come up with a counter, a, a counter vision of the world. And mm. uh, uh, I just read, have you read Asymmetry? No, by Lisa Halliday? Yeah. Yeah, what, what did you make of it? Uh, it's a remarkable book. For those of you who haven't read it, it's a debut novel that came out three months ago. And I'm probably not spoiling it by saying, well, I won't say any more. But um, <laughs> it just reminds you that, you know, you keep up with writing more than I do. There's more remarkable literature coming out than ever before in my lifetime, one after another. The book, mm. the, the Girls, last year by Emma Klein, who was evoking California in the 60s and 70s, so she'd never seen it, because she's only 27 years she, old. Yeah, she was a student of mine at Columbia. Really? Yeah, this is, oh. you know, the, and, and she was not the star student at my class. So Whoa. if any of you are in a class and yeah. you're not the student favorite pet, don't worry, you too can get a wonderful book deal and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and publish a book. I mean, I'm, I think one of the things that's, uh, that's always cheering to me um, about uh, reading widely is, is the fact that there is no way to do it properly. There are some people like Annie Prue who de debuted in fiction almost at age 50. Yeah. There are other people yeah. like Kezia Shiguro who by age 35 had written three masterpieces. Mm. Um, and everything in between. There's Tolstoy doing his great work late. You know, there's you know, Rambo burning out at age 23. And I, I think one of the things that's so cheering about reading um, th across the globe is, is to realize that there are also many different models for how to be a writer. Mm. And, one thing I like about you as a writer is there's many different selves within you. There's the, the you that, that is out there in Kathmandu going to movie nights, or, or there's the, the you that um, goes, and I want to ask you why you did this, goes to the woods in Canada to read um, uh, our oh, yes. Emily Dickinson. Yes. Why would you subject yourself to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I made me want to ask you, do you read towards where you go? Like woods, Calgary, Stark, Emily Dickinson. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I was in, in the Banff Center right after you, so you know the very building in which I was reading. But if Emily Dickinson can spend 26 years living in, uh, in a single room, I can spend uh, six days reading her reflections in the room. But, I mean, she was traveling to another planet almost by that degree of isolation, even more than Thoreau, who only spent two years there. So being alone in a dark place um, where there's nothing to anchor you seemed the right place to join her in a voyage. I mean, her letters, you probably know her letters, which shake the heart. They're so full of passion yeah. um, and, and so full of, of mystery. Um, when you were talking about having many selves, I think Cheslo Milos, another great Berkeley resident, said something like, the point of poetry is to remind us we don't have one self. I mean, we all have. Many selves. Fernando Pessoa took that literally. <laughs> he had 34, didn't he? Or something? 108. Really? And some of them yeah. reviewed some of the other one's books. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I review so many, so many books. Uh, I have other people working for me. Um, I want to ask you one final question, um, because we have a mutual friend in common who I think lives many of these concepts, uh, you know, being capable of spending time in solitude, but also in deep engagement, going out into the world, but also knowing when to retreat. 
um, fighting for justice but not becoming embrittled by the, the lack of progress. And that's Annie Dillard. Um, <laughs> yes, and indeed. She, I, I went to her home in Virginia, um, driving through the dark under great duress because she, she was complaining I was late um, with a friend from Jamaica because um, I have no driver's license. And I arrived to meet the most ferocious listening and observation device ever created in human form, which is Annie. And so we talked for a tiny bit, but what really got her warmed up was remembering playing ping pong with you um, on her front porch. And mm. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about her as a, as a kind of living Zen persona, as well as just what her writing does to you and what, what, what lays there for anyone here who hasn't read it recently or has never read it before? It's electric, real, and herself, I would say. And as you know, as you just described, she lives the most unplugged uh, life of anybody I know. She probably doesn't know who's in the White House. She will never know we spoke of her. Yeah, <laughs> yes. She will not be searching the Google alerts. Yes, no, exactly. And uh, many years ago, I noticed most of the writers I really respected live a great distance from the world, whether it's Cormac McCarthy or Annie Dillard. Or Thomas Philip Merton. At, when I was also Thomas Pynchon, Don DeLillo. Um, they're not on uh, Stephen Colbert every night. And you know, they are the reason that they're remaking the world is that they're far enough away from it to be able to put it in its place in a way that the rest of us can't. But Annie is the paramount um, example of that. And I was just reading her two days ago. And I, I think one of the things that's so fascinating for me is, um, she is she is impossible, as you were saying. Uh, if you want to know what it is to be like with to meet D.H. Lawrence, Annie Dillard is the closest who will come. <laughs> I mean, she's like a, 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 a throbbing live wire that can't be turned off, even at the ping pong table. Uh, but the great thing is, you know, God is her best friend, so all she does is give him a hard time. I mean, she spends her whole time raging against God. How could you do this? What's with these deformed babies? 120,000 people dead in a single flood in Bangladesh. What the hell are you thinking of? And it's a very interesting perspective. You know, she's not pretending she doesn't believe. She believes too much in him. And although I'm not a Christian, I've always admired that aspect of the Catholic tradition, Flannery O'Connor, Graham Greene, Annie Dillard, that the more seriously they take God, the more they refuse to let God off the hook. And mm. so that's one of the things that I think about with Annie. She's constantly shouting at the heavens, not getting more, much of an answer back, and shouting even more. But she writes like nobody else, um, I think we would agree, uniquely so. I mean, I think the other, there are two um, great presences who probably hover over creative writing departments now, Joan Didion and Annie Dillard, and they write in radically different ways, but they don't write like anybody else. And I think um, that's because Annie has been living in the wilderness. Mm. She writes a bit like Thoreau, but she took Thoreau places he couldn't have guessed. Actually, I, I would add a third to that, um, or, if, or four, we could do this forever, but <laughs> to make it a holy trinity, I'd, I'd add Rebecca Solnit. Mm. I think right now, uh, all, you know, a full half of my students want to be her handmaiden mm. uh, in some way or other, <laughs> um, yes. of all genders. Uh, you know, and it's, it's an exciting thing because for a long time, I think um, the, the practice of writing in, in nonfiction meant a certain objectivity and um, a putting aside of, of activism. Mm. And she's managed uh, by threading a line between Didion and, and um, Annie, Annie Dillard to, to, to create a third way, um, if you will. And it, it's a third way that actually lo lots and lots of um, essayists and writers of color have themselves had to live. Your friend Ruch Richard Rodriguez, Kaisi Lehman is another wonderful um, essayist right now, Roxane Gay, um, the list goes on and on. And it's such a great time for the essay because in some ways, the, the definition of what essay writing is, and yeah. you've lived this, is to find the third way um, between mm. yourself and your thoughts, between yourself and the world. Mm. Um, I think we should probably, at this point, find a way to talk to you as well. Um, you've been listening so attentively, and I'm sure you probably have a question for Pico. Um, or for John. Uh, I, will, I will try to be as inspiring as him, but it's, it's very difficult. Um, uh, let's give him a round of applause while well, we to you, up. To you, Yes. Jake's so, Beach. 
Um, can I hold it? Um, <laughs> yes, good to, good to see you again. Um, I don't know if you remember our little story. I don't remember what we said to each other. Well, actually, um, I find you a very gracious man because I had this manuscript, almost 300 pages, and I'm like a no, nobody knows me, and I approach you with your eminence and your reputation, and you were so humble and gracious to accept the manuscript from me, but I never thought that you would ever spend the time to read it. And the, the next day, I was walking around the, 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 the festival, and I heard this voice, Ian, Ian, hey, I've been trying to find you. I read your manuscript. <laughs> uh, Pico spent the whole night, I don't know if he's, how fast he reads, but he read the entire manuscript. And you gave me a feedback about my travels in China. Yeah, it's really nice to see you again. Yes. I know you've met millions of people since that, but, but I, it's always stayed with me. Anyway, so, you know, I'm here, you know, that responds to how can literature create a better world. And I want to deal with the mundane. It's good to speak in, in abstract, idealistic terms, and you know, all these glorified um, expressions about uh, literature and the potential of literature. But you know, I spend a lot of time in China, and I only come to America like for a month each year. So my green card is in jeopardy. Anyway, last year, during just one month, um, some friends invited me to an Indian festival, an Indian charity event in Silicon Valley. And uh, I stepped outside briefly to use a portalette. And when I returned, the, the security guard met me and told me, you don't belong here. I said, how do you know that? And I, I gave her a piece of my mind. Um, I've been back now from China two months. The first week I came here, I went to a store in the Mission, a, a telephone company to, to see. And the security guard met me at the gate, at the door, half open. Um, Do you want something in here? I said, is this the way you greet white people coming in here? He said, yes. I, I, at the same time, a white man was coming out. And the white man said, no, he did not ask me that. He just opened the door and let me in. Two nights ago, I went to an Asian restaurant, also in the Mission, in Valencia. As I stepped in the restaurant, there was this woman standing in the aisle. Um, you want something? I said, is this how you greet people? Is this how you greet people? I said, I don't want anything. Good night. And I stepped out. So I said, OK, maybe somebody's having a bad night. I was with another friend, a white friend. So I went to another Asian restaurant that I had been to just last week. I asked, um, do, you, do you do takeout? She says, no, we, do, do, we don't do takeout. I said, you don't do takeout? I said, I was here last week, and um, I, I sat here and ate. And somebody came and, and took takeout, and now you're telling me that you don't do takeout? And I gave her a piece of my mind. My wife, no, 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 please, give me a chance. This is, this is America, okay? There are not many black people in here, so give me a voice. Um, so my white friend, I said, look here, this is how I was treated. I want you to go in there and ask them if they do take out. Of course, he went in, and without any question, she gave him the menu. How can literature begin to address this? Write another book. In other words, no, no, no. your response to that would be to make literature of your own, share your story, and then all of us can be instructed by it, because many of us haven't had that experience, I'm, I'm, and we would learn I'm from your hopeful. experience something good would come out of it. I'm not hopeful. You're not so sure? I'm not hopeful. I, I, thank you for, thank you for I'll, I'll respond to you, because uh, the, the first issue of, of this magazine that I edit, it had a piece by a Jamaican writer named Garnett Cadigan. Um, and he's a, he, like Rebecca Solnit, who we were speaking of, and it's, it's called Black and Blue, um, and his, his, or Walking While Black. And the, the, the essay is a, is a catalog, as you just gave us, of a series of misreadings of him, um, none of which happened in Jamaica, but he moves to New Orleans and on to New York around the time that Eric Garner is choked to death. And that essay, um, we put that onto LitHub, the website that I work at, 
It was, it's been read 650,000 times. Um, and so, I, as you noticed while you were asking your question, everyone here was listening. So even though you haven't written, read a book, everyone is this much more co cognizant that these types of interactions happen. And I think the culture is getting better at, at producing them and publishing them and curating them. And you're right, the, the ultimate onus really is, is on white people in, in many re regards, because if, if, if in Starbucks, the, the guy that those two guys was meeting was, was there a little earlier, the, you know, that, that, that would have been diffused and those two guys would not have spent seven hours in jail. Um, and I, I think we all, as beneficiaries of white Americans, of power that we were accidentally given by a lottery, um, have, a, have a duty to understand that power and to, um, to give it back, you know, because it never really was ours to, to hold. So I, I'm hopeful. Um, I understand why, you, why you're not. And you Yeah, but I think, um, virus. yeah, I agree. But I think it's a virus that, that um, like uh, certain colonial viruses, do, does come from, from white culture. And I think we, we need to identify that white culture is in some ways defined by some form of possessing that virus. Hello, um, my name Hi. is Esther. And I want to thank you. I really enjoyed this evening. And what I wanted to talk to you uh, just for a second about was cultural appropriation, uh, because you've mentioned it a lot. And I just wanted to say what, the, what I believe, just as an African American, what it means to me. Mm -hmm. And basically, it has a lot to do really with economics. Mm -hmm. For example, um, back in 1979, there was a movie and it was called Ten, and there was a woman, and her name was Bo Derek, and she was supposed to be like the epitome of beauty. She wore her hair in cornrows, and one of the things that spread through the African American community is that suddenly a hairstyle that is thousands of years old, it's an African hairstyle, was raised up to be the beauty of, of women because a blonde hair, blue eyed woman wore the hairstyle. To us, that's what it means by cultural appropriation. And it showed up again um, this year in January when Ken Kardashian wore a similar hairstyle and she didn't call it cornrows, she called it Bo Derek braids. So again, I want to say that it isn't for me that if a white person wants to write about a black person that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. Many times it has to do with what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. How much do you know about this character? Are you doing it based on stereotypes and are you doing it for money? Because many times the cultural appropriation that really gets at least me and my friends upset is when, let, let's say, that there is a black person who's been a rapper for decades and nobody has paid any attention to him. But then Eminem shows up and then all of a sudden he's paid millions of dollars for doing the exact same thing that the black guy was, would, was doing and not getting any attention and not getting the amount of money. So in that situation, I would say that's cultural appropriation. So I just wanted to make sure, just really for the audience, for them to understand at least my point of view of where the issue of cultural appropriation is and it, because we're all, we're all writers, well many of us are writers, or we're lovers of literature. So I just wanted to say it has to do with the depth and the purpose behind what you're doing. And um, so if you want to write about a black character, Go ahead and do it. Just make sure you're looking at it for what is your reasoning, you know, and what is the depth and how much do you know about this character. And then everybody should have a right to write about anyone. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I think one reason I wanted to raise cultural appropriation was exactly so that we could have a clarification like that. So that's just what I, I wanted to hear. Of course, it gets more complicated. I loved what you said about depth and motivation. I think those are the two things we have to bring to it. Of course, we're living in a pell-mell world in which the average person here, whatever her origin, may well be practicing yoga, eating sushi, and you know, doing tai chi too. And somebody in China, meanwhile, is taking everything from this country, and to some extent, it's never understood deeply enough. But that's such a tonic reminder. Thank you. Oh, you've told it. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Bernali, and um, I am here to ask a question about the morality of travel. And this idea that travel is um, going to transform you. And partly I'm, I'm asking that uh, from a perspective of living in a world uh, around climate change, where getting on an airplane is mm. one of the most destructive mm. things you can mm. do on a personal level. Mm. Uh, apart from maybe eating meat, but you know, they're right up there. Only 5% of the world has ever set foot on a plane. Mm. And uh, even though we like to think of ourselves as travelers, most of us are tourists. And the tourism industry is often described among those of us who study it as a new kind of colonialism, mm -hmm. right? This idea of people just dropping into a place and who makes the money from it? It's the airlines, it's the hotel that you're staying in. Maybe these days it's Airbnb, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I came to the session hoping for literature, which I see as a more low emissions way of getting to know the world, um, to really be uplifted. Uh, but I'm just wondering, as a travel writer, and you know, I grew up with this notion of travel is good, even though my mother always told me that you know, if you take a bitter melon and you take the bitter melon around the world, it will still be bitter. So some of it, some of how you absorb travel is based on what you read, where you come from, what baggage you carry. Uh, and though it can be transformative, maybe it depends on what you read before you go. But as a travel writer and you know, as me, somebody who has thought of travel as transformative and is having to really challenge that idea in mm. the age of climate change, in the age of uh, the tourism uh, industry. Can you just reflect on that? Well, I love what you say about literature as low emission travel. I, I would love to steal that because <laughs> that's as good a line as I can imagine. I, I think you travel by walking down the street. I mean, in Berkeley, you can meet all the cultures where you don't have to get on a plane. And indeed, if it's damaging the planet to do so, Hanoi is, as I was saying, three blocks away, and every other culture is too, and that's a great beauty that wasn't the case 60 years ago. So I think travel has very little to do with miles, oceans crossed, or miles got on your United Airlines account, and everything to do with encountering the other, and the other, as I was saying, is now on our doorstep. So travel just means leaving the, the comfort of your own assumptions. Uh, and, and insofar as many people are worried about the environmental consequences, in Berkeley, you're lucky, because all the world is right here. I just want to say, I think, especially for this audience, it's a great reminder, and I hope all, everybody heard it, so thank you. No, I, w I wondered one day if you would write a book about your backyard, you know, uh, about Santa it's Barbara. It's, uh, well, my book on the backyard's coming out next May. Are you serious? Uh, but it's, it's, it's actually the answer to your question about simplifying myself. It's a, it's a book about my, my backyard in Japan, it's a lot about ping pong, so Annie Dillard will be happy. Uh, and it's also about the blessing, to speak to the last question, of you know, my wife and I live in a small rented apartment. We don't have a car, we don't have a bicycle, we only travel as far as our feet will carry us. And the whole world is there, um, as Annie Dillard knows. So, um, yes. And of course, a famous Frenchman wrote a whole travel book about his room. Yes. Um, <laughs> Xavier Lemestre. Well, what strikes me most about you is your humility. And I don't think it's an accident at all. It's a consequence of where you were raised or in, in your culture um, that, you're, uh, that you demonstrate so well. If you go into Westminster Abbey, uh, there's a lot of plaques of, of all these people that were deemed good enough to be recognized forever. And on these plaques, they could have used any adjective to describe themselves um, or, and their accomplishments. But the most common word in Westminster Abbey to describe these famous people is dispassionate or apassionate. It's not an accident that coming from that culture that you are, that you resemble uh, humility. America has the opposite culture. We have a culture of bombast, the Wild West, and we've had that for quite a long time. And it's gotten us into quite a bit of trouble today and in the past. 
uh, especially because we won World War II, which got us this crazy idea that, we were, that, that this streak would continue forever, and it's been the opposite since then. Given that we don't have a similar history as our British, you know, as our people across the pond, what would you suggest that we can do to gain some of your humility as a country? As a country, again, this includes people in smaller places, not just in, on the coasts, but especially, especially on the coasts as well. Uh, well, thank you for the compliment. Uh, I have the big advantage over many people in this room of not being American. And so as a foreigner here, I've got to say I find extraordinary kindness and friendliness in so many parts of the United States. I used to drive across country often with my friends from England, my, my uh, classmates, and we couldn't have found a more hospitable place. We wouldn't have found the warm reception we found here in most of the old world, for example, in England or other parts of the old world. So I think it's a prerogative of a resident to see what's going wrong in his country. Uh, and it's the beauty of the outsider to bring back to any country the blessings that are sometimes overlooked. So I would not be quite so harsh on America. I do agree with you that the curious aspect of the last 40 years is that the strongest nation in the world is the youngest. And the country that most is controlling the world is not always the one most keen to see the world, as I was saying before. And I do think that the benefit of Canada is it's never thought of itself as the center of the world, which is why it has some of that humility uh, you mentioned, as well as the global openness and global consciousness. But I find on the individual level, um, great openness in, in, in this country. Uh, and uh, I think, the beauty of going to another country is often coming back to your own homeland with clearer eyes of what to appreciate here. So when I'm traveling elsewhere, uh, I sometimes come back much more favorably thinking of the United States. Um, but certainly insofar as we're no longer the center of the world, uh, that's a great and liberating thing. I was doing an event here in San Francisco three weeks ago with the great writer Mohsin Hamid, who lives in Lahore. He you know, graduated from all the Ivy League colleges, had a great job in New York, and chose to return to Lahore uh, to raise his children. And he said, well, the one thing it's hard for people in the U.S. to realize is that the rest of the world has moved on, and now talented <laughs> people are moving to Beijing and... and uh, dreaming of going to Bangalore and that the whole center of gravity has changed radically. So even so far as that is true, uh, America will be humbled more and that could be a good thing. Um, I think we're running a short time, so maybe this could be um, our last question um, and maybe you can ask your questions in the signing line, which will uh, start immediately after this outside. I wanted to say thank you, and also I was hoping you'd say a little bit, um, hopefully of appreciation, about literary translation. You spoke of writers from other nations writing in English, but literary translation is another way that we gain access to other sensibilities and other cultures, and very little of it is published in the United States, and very little of it is read, and mm -hmm. it's underappreciated, but it too is a a great thing. Yes, less and less of it, I think, as English more and more dominates the world. And I think when I was describing how the world is in a grievous state, maybe that the first thing I mentioned was how England no longer rules the waves, but English do does, and so we're not hearing enough from people writing in other languages. The beauty of the modern moment, though, is all these writers from other cultures coming to our country and writing such beautiful English. Uh, as well as bringing, as John was saying, fresh perspectives. Ha Jin was a busboy in a pizza restaurant in Philadelphia, and I think eight years later he won the National Book Award for fiction. And that kind of thing is happening a lot, but I agree with you absolutely. We're not hearing enough. Um, in India, this is a very painful issue because there are, by some counts, 22,000 languages there, uh, or dialects for sure, and we're mostly... Con conversant only with the people writing in English, and so there's a huge discrepancy, and I'm sure other countries have that same sad story. One curiosity about translation in my lifetime is that so many writers from other countries are so fluent in English that they oversee their translations into English, like Orhan Pamuk or W.G. Zebalt from Germany, and one of the amazing things about reading W.G. Zebalt's books in English translated are that they 
involve a kind of English that is antique and has a strange fragrance and is not like any English that's been written for 300 years. And he's created a whole new kind of English by writing in German and then helping his translators um, create a kind of hybrid language. So that represents the best case scenario, but I agree with you. Um, the, the world is moving in that way much too much in one direction. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Pico Iyer. Thank you, it's John. A pleasure.